the fact that governments fail is the point that most people cannot conceive. They conceive of a bank failure, they conceive of a business going out of business, but they cannot conceive that a government can fail. Yet history teaches us again and again and again that governments do fail, that this one is failing, and that you cannot rely on anything coming from them to be one truthful or two to your benefit. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today our special guest is a returning visitor, David Morgan, renowned guru on silver markets and silver fundamentals and precious metals in general, sought-after speaker for conferences and industry analysis. David, thanks for rejoining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Uh, Doug, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me back. We can't escape the opportunity having you on to ask you for your perspectives on the fundamentals of the silver and precious metals market. People have really seen quite a su surprising roller coaster of activity over the last three years from uh, regaining you know, previous uh, interim highs on silver of close to 50 to uh, lows in the, in the 14s uh, a couple weeks ago. And wonder if you can give people a, just to give them some reality check on what the, what the real fundamentals are as far as uh, supply and demand and long-term picture and, and sort of near-term uh, situation for precious metals. Okay, great. I certainly will do that. But before I go there, I would like to discuss price a little bit more, and that is uh, you know, what we witnessed over the last four years, or maybe slightly longer than that. I mean, silver, uh, going back into the prior to the 2011 high end, the end of April, uh, it had a breakout at $19, and it went from 19 to 26 consolidated there briefly. QE2 was announced, moved from 26 up to 48 uh, got lucky or not, but called that top, told people who were with trading positions should probably take profits, and anybody with big positions should probably hedge. I mean, the biggest mistake I made was what I did call the top was, one, not explaining how long it could last. I thought it could go two, three years at the most. It's been four. And also uh, thinking that it would hold at the $26 level for a long time it did, and then breaking down and holding around the $18 level, which it did for a long time, like 14 months, and then, of course, slipping down. So my bottom calls, obviously, have not been as good as my top calls. I do think we have seen the bottom. There was a spike low you referenced, Dunnigan, uh, a couple weeks ago. In the 14 and change, it was a spike low, very typical of a silver market that does these extreme moves in one day, uh, with what I call a spike, and uh, since then we've been moving higher, we're up in the 17 level. So that takes care of the price. Now back to the fundamentals. Uh, first fundamental, still based on prices that were selling under the cost of production for almost all primary silver producers. Primary silver producers make up about 25% of the market. Uh, the other 70% or so comes from uh, base metal miners, and they're not doing all that well either. Uh, we've had Glencore has kind of uh, hold, held off for like three weeks of production, basically gone on uh, hiatus for a while just to put uh, not so much iron ore out there because the Chinese, which has been, has been the big driver for the commodity sector in general, metals in particular, energy as well, has basically overbuilt massively and their economy is starting to contract, which means the demand side uh, is waning significantly. Look at the oil price. And that's not based on uh, less demand. That's another area I won't go into. But anyway, coming back on point, the, the Silver Institute this week put Have out you ever heard a of study Nene? that this will be CRU, or commission. CRU did the study. I read it. I need to read it again. But they're looking at silver industrial demand to increase by roughly, I think it was 20% or so, by 2018. 
And a lot of those areas were what we put in our new book, The Silver Manifesto, and this has to do with silver batteries, uh, solar voltaics, uh, more in the textile industry, more in the metal industry, more in the nanotech area, more in the ethylene oxide area, and on and on. You could read the report. You can go to the Silver Institute and check it out. If you're very much of a silver aficionado, you ought to read the report. You ought to download it. And if you're really uh, a hardcore silver bull, you should probably pass it on to those that you know and like and want to reference this material. So the demand side on the industrial side has been pretty flat for several years, around the 550 million ounces per year. Uh, but now uh, there's going to be these drivers that will be taking the industrial demand far higher over the next three years. If you couple that with what the investment demand has been, uh, we still have a very strong demand side for silver. Uh, now, the demand side is a little, um, it's not all that difficult to analyze, but the data shows a different situation. And the situation on the demand side for investment is this. The silver stackers continue to add to their positions. This is very evident by the amount of silver eagles and silver maples and all the government minted coins that are out there that are being sitting record highs for the amount that are taken off the market. So the silver stackers are just going about their business. Uh, they're probably, a lot of them, happy that uh, prices are low and they're able to buy at these levels and continue their buying at these levels. But we haven't seen the demand that on the investment side that I wish we would or could would be the large institutions. For several years, we would see, uh, let's say, uh, the Physical Silver Trust or Sprott or the Central Fund of Canada or maybe the Zurich Continental Bank or one of these large silver entities or so funds, <coughs> excuse me, that holds physical go into the market at low prices uh, float a prospectus uh, or add on to one of their uh, one of their uh, forms that they've already filed with the authorities to add to their silver positions, and I'm waiting for that to take place. The problem for these funds is that they really can't float that uh, and make a large silver purchase unless their fund is trading at a premium, and a lot of these have gone back and forth for a very low premium that wouldn't allow them to buy more silver to a net discount where they would be losing money by buying silver in the marketplace. But I am I'm pretty confident that uh, once silver starts to great, gain some traction here, and it's still very undervalued, that you may see one or more actually come into the market and buy, let's say, a big tranche of silver, something like what's been seen in the past, you know, uh, 10 million ounce, 20 million ounce, 30 million ounce type of a purchase. And not knowing exactly how tight the market is, but much, much tighter than the price would indicate, a uh, 30 million ounce purchase all at once might have a very, very large impact on the amount of physical that would have to be obtained in a very short amount of time and could influence the price significantly. We have to wait and see to be sure if that statement's true, but I believe it is. So from your outlook of um, the recommendation to small-scale individual households, people who are interested in reducing the risk of their family's finances given the various uh, power plays that are potentially happening out in the world, uh, what are some considerations? And I know, again, I'll, I'll reiterate here that we don't give financial advice on this channel, and that's not I'm not asking you for. I'm just saying what considerations do you Think about for your for your uh, household and for people who's who you talk with about ways to reduce risk for themselves. Yeah, well, it's to diversify, you know, to diversify the things that you need. I mean, you know, if you're just uh, getting by, so to speak, and you're doing a little bit better than living paycheck to paycheck, but not much better than that, and that that constitutes a great deal of people out there, especially in this economic environment. Uh, you know, you got to check the very basics. I mean, you you, know, you can't make a mistake putting back extra food. I mean, that's a no-lose situation. Inflation is much higher than the government statistics portray. Uh, food and energy are out of the equation, as we all know. 
So that would certainly be one. Uh, anything along those lines, anything that you know you use all the time, would be one. But as far as you know, going to my specialty on uh, financial markets, the big big picture, and narrowing it down in the silver, I was asked on a recent show that I did. You know, well, what's exactly the correct amount? Of course, there is no such thing because. One size doesn't fit all, but I was kind of thinking out loud as I answered the question, and I went back to some work that uh, Jason Hommel has done, myself, and also Chris Dwayne. So if you go back to the Roman Empire, the average soldier, worker, citizen, uh, their entire day's effort would be one denarius, which was roughly the same as a silver dime, or roughly a tenth ounce. And so... If you wanted a, uh, you know, most financial planners in the mainstream will tell you you need six months. You know, if you have six months of cash on hand, you're in really, really good shape. And, you know, I think that's a good number. It's as good as any. It's, you know, you don't want three days. You don't want a week. You probably want a few months anyway. So let's use the six-month figure. So if you use six months and use a tenth ounce, that's a very small amount of silver. But I bumped it up to an ounce. And today an ounce is, you know, well under $20, and I predicted uh, silver to be about $100 an ounce as a minimum uh, at the high, and it could be much higher than that. It could not. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. So let's just take it at one ounce per day. So that would suggest for six months you need roughly 200 ounces. So I think that's a good number to shoot for, for most people. Uh, 200 ounces of silver when... uh, you know, very few things are working correctly, and we see them getting in that situation more and more every day, would probably be enough barter material for you, for people that were willing to barter for silver, which won't be everybody, but uh, it will be a great majority of people, and I base that on fact, not fiction. If you look at what happened in Argentina during the 2000 collapse and the recent one, they certainly do trade with each other in various ways, but one of the main ways that they trade goods is with silver, uh, sometimes for silver jewelry, but nonetheless silver and gold, of course. So, you know, I've seen a few things on the Internet lately about, you know, that these coins will be absolutely worthless if the collapse ever happens. Well, there will be people that probably refuse to take them or don't understand what they are, don't think they're real or whatever. Be, you know, that's true of any situation. But uh, there will be a great deal of people that understand what they are will be willing to barter for them. So probably enough said on that. But, you know, it's, it's, I never really thought it through before, you know, what is the correct amount. I'm sorry, not saying that's, that's perfect for everybody. But for the average person out there, I think that's probably enough. And certainly, again, you know, put back what you need more than uh, – you know, barter items, which would be, or as you can think about on the barter side. I mean, I don't uh, pretend to know that much about it. I do. I mean, think about it. There was a book written by uh, John Pugsley, if you could get it. It's been out of print for years, called The Alpha Strategy. And in The Alpha Strategy, he goes through what are some of the best barter items out there. Soap is a good one. Razor blades is a good one. He talks a lot about having high unit value per volume which is what silver is. You have a lot of value in a small amount of space. And razor blades have a lot of value in a small amount of space, as an example. That's just one that comes to my mind from reading the book, but it's been years since I read it. But if you can find it on the Internet or get a used copy of the Alpha Strategy and you're really thinking more along the lines of you know, how to prep on, bar- on the barter side rather than on metals, that would certainly be a good uh, starting point. Now, you get around to a lot of conferences both nationally and and uh, you also have an international reputation so what can you tell us about the difference between a typical household in america versus say uh, india or the or the far east uh, as far as their attitude towards amassing gold or precious metals well these people outside of uh, north america understand that their government's money has always become worthless and they just basically don't trust their currencies so they are very, very uh, avid purchasers of any extra that they have, any savings that they can accumulate into the metals. It's, it's not even something that you even have to mention. It's, it's almost in their DNA, in their genes. I mean, it's a whole different attitude that you see uh, in other parts of the world than what you see in, 
in North America. The paper paradigm is so much of a brainwashed feature into North America, the U.S. primarily, that uh, it's much, much different in other areas. They know, and Europe is, is much into the paper paradigm as well, with the exception of Germany. And Germany, uh, certainly more than any other place in Europe, and I've been throughout almost all of Europe, not every single country, but most, uh, they get it because with the Weimar Republic, uh, they learn from their grandparents or the great grandparents that these things do happen and how devastating it is and what could take place and why you need precious metals. But uh, North America, Europe, they're still locked into the paper paradigm. But you go into the Middle East, uh, to Asia, uh, you get a whole different attitude that they know if they're going to save anything, save it in metal. And turning to the direction that this is all heading, I recently had the opportunity to see a documentary movie, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It's available free online. We'll put a link to it in the description of this video. And uh, you appear in there as one of the consultants about the meaning and the role that capitalism and consumerism and uh, different behaviors have led to uh, and the direction that that's taking the, the human uh, community and the risks that are inherent in that. And the, the maker of that film talks about these major themes of uh, crooked finance and terrorism and poverty and ecological collapse that are coming. And uh, if you could kind of walk us through uh, your perspectives on each one of those, first of all, starting with why would we, why would we be talking about crooked finance? Uh, I know a lot of people wish they had uh, more financial abundance, but what's what do people need to know about how there may be a un, the uneven playing field or the stacked deck? Oh, great. Thanks for asking. Uh, yes, the, uh, the film talks about the, the age of empire and the stages that an empire goes through and it walks through all the different stages and it talks about the final phase, which the movie makes a very, very clear analogy that we are in the final stages of an empire and we're going into the collapse phase. And so they start pointing out different parts of the system that are collapsing, finance, ecology, uh, you know, a lot of that, as you mentioned. So the main theme is, one, to know where we're at, and two, how is it going to unravel is a question that the movie asks the, you know, the audience. There's no one that has all the answers, but they point out very specifically different areas. So on the crooked finance thing, it's basically the same story we've seen throughout history, which is debasing the currency and putting on a smiley face and the political class telling the rest of us that everything is okay. And then what they're really doing is they're taking every bit of wealth that still remains in the system for themselves. They're basically not representing the people in any way, shape, or form. They're basically lying through their teeth and they're taking the spoils uh, for themselves, thinking that that wealth is, you know, going to protect them or whatever, when the reality, it certainly might be valuable in some context, but uh, the fact that governments fail is the point that most people cannot conceive. They conceive of a bank failure, they conceive of a business going out of business, but they cannot conceive that a government can fail. Yet history teaches us again and again and again that governments do fail, that this one is failing, that's one of the points of the movie, and that you cannot rely on anything coming from them to be one, truthful, or two, to your benefit. Now, that's very difficult for someone that's getting a, you know, a food stamp card right now and being able to eat uh, because of that, and you know, God bless the people that truly need that. Uh, what happens, however, is that the system collapses to a level where even that stops working at some point. Now, I'm not forecasting that. I'm just going back on the basis of the movie and what the movie has shown in the past. Will that repeat in the future? Well, history rhymes. It doesn't repeat. So just be prepared that it could get in a situation where, you know, your food stamps might still be there, but... Another area that you rely on uh, doesn't work as well or is an intermittent situation. So 
I'm being a bit vague because no one knows exactly how this thing is going to unravel, but it is unraveling. You're seeing more and more people taking to the streets throughout all different type of political systems and basically being uh, very vocal about the fact that things are not right, that there's you know food problems, energy problems, uh, unfairness in the system, again, throughout the political system, different... Uh, political systems that are failing.